全部放在一个一张里面，就是要全部这样，太多张了。OK。All right, shall we gather together? Okay, why don't we go around and just greet each other and tell them I'm so happy to see you here today. Okay, especially those who are watching online, uh, you know, wherever you're gathered, I think it's even more important. For us right now to recite the Apostles' Creed, because we are united not in just one place, but we are united in our belief, and it is our belief that draws us together with the rest of the body of Christ. So before we start today, let's all say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Father, we thank you for gathering us, Lord, wherever we are, at our homes, at various places, as we watch this service online. Father, we just remember that as a body, as the body is going through uh, this period of transition and difficulty, we pray, O oh God, that your presence will be with us everywhere we are as we are gathered. As we unite ourselves in the body of Christ, we are united in our faith. And we are united in our love for each other. And our prayer, so oh God, to you is that your hand will continue to watch over us and protect us and over our family. We thank you for this time that we can gather to worship you because, Lord, you are still the God of the whole earth, the creator of heaven and earth. And in your name, everything, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And no sickness or disease. Lord shall overtake us but your hand of protection is over us so be with your people I pray as we commit today's service into your hands in Jesus name we pray and everyone say Amen Amen let's give the Lord a big hand right now Amen praise the Lord
so happy to see all of you here today. Right, so I'm going to read a verse to all of you is that uh, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. You know, 弟兄姐妹我们今天在这里敬拜耶稣的时候我相信圣灵会大大的充满我们给我们平安因为圣经说到我留下平安给你们我把自己的平安赐给你们阿们阿们让我们来敬拜耶稣好吗哈利路亚
主耶稣，你是我们的君王，我们是你的百姓。求主眷顾我们，看顾我们，常常与我们同在。主啊，让你的同在安慰我们。当我们惧怕的时候，当我们有需要的时候，求主来安慰我们，让我们知道你是亲近我们的主，与我们同在的主。你是我们的君王，我们敬拜赞美你。Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our King, our Lord, and truly our Savior. Even in the midst of going through this very difficult time, 
for the last seven to eight weeks, we remember your word that says in Psalms 91, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Lord, we just thank you that and claim and again trust in your word that a thousand may fall on our side, ten thousand on our right hand, but a pestilence will not come near us. And even, oh God, and even if it should, that we know that your hand of grace and healing will be upon us. So we are not living our life with fear, but we want to live our life with faith that we don't live by sight, but we live by faith. And so I pray even for those who are, Lord, watching online even right now, where, wherever we are, that may your presence, your grace, your protection be upon us and our loved ones, our family members, our friends, and those in our workplace. Father, we also pray for, as we go through uh, you know, as our business, our work, our career, Lord, it has already been affected. We pray for your grace. We pray for your mercy. We cry out to you to help us be our very present help in times of need. Lord, we do not know if things are out of our hands, but we trust in you that in due time, you will make all things beautiful and you will work all things out for our good. So we praise you and worship you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a big hand right now. Hallelujah. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Amen. Okay, please be seated now. I know that we are, uh, you know, it's such a big transition, not just for uh, our gathering, but also for many, many churches in Singapore. So I just want to thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we are just trying to do this for two weeks and we see how this goes. Um, depending on the situation, we will uh, update the, all of us again, whether we continue to do it online or we think of another way. All right, some other possible ways are we, instead of having a Sunday gathering, we may just meet at the homes and break up into cell groups. So we will let you know, but just for two weeks, okay? So next week, I just want to put this announcement up that next week we will still be doing this online uh, for our next week's uh, meeting. You got that on the announcement? No, the next week's slide. Thank you. Yes, praise the Lord. Okay, so next week, we will still do it online, at, uh, but the timing will be from 2 to 4 p.m. Okay, 2 to 4 p.m. Praise the Lord. Now, I just want to go straight to the preaching of the Word, and uh, today we will not have a very long service, but we are going to continue our sharing from Matthew chapter 21. So if you have... Um, if you have a Bible, can you please open up to Matthew chapter 21? We will be looking at verse 1 all the way to verse 22 today. Okay? And the title of my message today is called, Lord, Save Us. As we look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you that Hosanna to the Son of David. That indeed, you are the Lord who will save us. And you have come, you have saved us, and you will continue to do that work of saving and we pray today that as we hear this word, that our faith and our hearts will again be strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we have been, we have a goal in our fellowship, right? That we'll go through the different books of the Bible. And we have uh, started on the Gospel of Matthew. And now we are in Matthew chapter 21. 
Now, if you would like to hear those previous messages, you can hear it online. In our, we have put it all on the Google Drive link. Uh, if you need the, the information on the link, you can just look for one of our uh, volunteers here, like especially Sharon, and she'll be able to direct you to the link. Now, um, and I've been showing you from the Gospel of Matthew that there is a narrative, what we call a narrative or a story, okay, a story. And the last time we saw Jesus coming from Galilee, which is at the top of Israel, and He is making His way to Jerusalem. Okay, so now when we come to Matthew chapter 21, we find that He is drawing near and He is now entering into Jerusalem. So there is a train of thought and there's a flow. And if you remember along the way, uh, over the last many weeks we have, I've shared with you, that Jesus along the way has been telling His disciples that he is going to go to Jerusalem, he will be betrayed, he will be handed into the hands of the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and they will torture him, they will crucify him, and on the third day, he will rise again from the dead. So as he enters into Jerusalem, he is entering, knowing full well, he is going to enter into what we call his passion. Okay? The passion week is the last week before he is hung on the cross. Now, before we continue, I want to share with you, a, recently, when I was in Singapore Bible College, a particular uh, lecture, there was this joke. Okay? It's a joke. It's okay that you, at the end of the day, you don't laugh. Okay? But I want to show there's a purpose for this joke, so I'm just going to put it up there. If you have heard it, then it's fine as well. Okay? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. After a good meal and a bottle of wine, they lay down for the night and they went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes awoke and nudged his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions and millions of stars. So Holmes asked, what does that tell you? Watson pondered for a minute. And he said, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you? Holmes was silent for a moment, then spoke, Watson, you idiot, somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> I share this joke to, to point out that we can sometimes miss out on what God is trying to tell us or what God is trying to show us because of our own perspective. You understand? So we need to see the Word of God from Jesus' perspective, not from our own perspective because very often we come and we approach God, God's Word from the perspective of our need. So I say we are going through this virus right now. So we come and approach it seeing that, okay, if I come to church this Sunday, what am I going to hear that will tell me that all things will be well with me? You know what I mean? But when we study the Word of God, we must come in first from what is God's perspective. And then from there, let the Word sink into our hearts. And from there, we reflect on how we should respond to God's Word. And that should be the way we should do it. And so everything that Jesus does is significant. Okay, so let's read Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 all the way to verse 9 and then we will take a we'll, uh, let me, then we will continue with the sermon now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her loose them and bring them to me and if anyone says anything to you you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately He will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And verse 10, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Now, let me just stop here for a moment. Do you see that there are many different ways of entering Jerusalem? Okay? And there are def- different, different, uh, Jesus could have walked into Jerusalem, right? But why does he tell his disciples to go to the other side? Okay, let's, let's look at verse 1 again. When he drew near, where was he? He came to this place called the Mount of Olives. And then he sent his disciples, say, go into the village opposite you. So that's very, these are all very significant things. Because if you have been to Israel, you will know that the Mount of Olives is exactly opposite the Temple Mount. And so today, the Temple Mount is called the Dome of the Rock. Now, there is a, it's a mosque over there. And usually, you will stand at the Mount of Olives and you will take a paranormal picture with the Dome on the Rock. You understand? So when Jesus was with His disciples at the Mount of Olives, looking at the other side, what is, what is the village on the other side? Zion. Jerusalem. Okay? So He says, go and tell, go into the village there and tell a person that to release a donkey. So, verse 4 says this, This was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Which prophet? is prophet Zechariah. Okay, so we don't have to turn to it, but we, you can go back and read Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. The important thing is verse 5, you see? He says, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. You see the first verse there, Tell the daughter of Zion? You see, so he's, Going to, he's asking his disciples, go to Jerusalem, which is Zion, and tell the people there that your king is coming to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every single detail is fulfilled. And then he says, Behold, your king is coming to you, but lowly and sitting on a donkey. Do you understand? So when I read this, as I was saying, there are many ways of going into Jerusalem, but Jesus would do it. Why? Because He is out to fulfill Scripture. Every single thing He does is to fulfill the Word. So there is a written Word, and Jesus is the living Word. Now, I say this to tell you and I, okay, that this is how we should live our life as a Christian. That we, Now that we have the written Word for us, let us be the living Word. Every time you have to make a decision, you make a decision based on what the Word says. So if the Bible says, do not return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. So sometimes when someone in the marketplace does something evil to you, and you instead of retaliating, you do good to them, and your friends look at you and say, why are you so foolish? Why would you even do a thing like that? You, your answer is, I am fulfilling Scripture. I am trying to lift out what the Word says. Do you understand? If it says, love your, na- love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Pray for them. Bless them. And when you really do that, and your friends look at you and, 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 and ask you, why would you even do a thing like that? You say, because I'm fulfilling Scripture. I'm living it out, the Word. Now, not only did Jesus... Uh, you know, fulfill Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. If you notice over here in verse 10, I read to you, right? And when he had come, he came what, into Jerusalem, right? So the other prophet's prophecy that he fulfilled was actually the prophet Malachi. And this one, I want you to look at the uh, slide I have prepared. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger and He will prepare the way before Me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to His temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, Zechariah and Malachi are two prophets that are what we call post-exilic prophets. That means they are prophets after the children of Israel have come back from exile. And what, what, 
what did they do when they come back from exile? They came back to rebuild Jerusalem. Do you remember Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem? Do you remember Zerubbabel? He rebuilt the temple again, the city of Jerusalem, because it was destroyed by the Babylonians. So along the way, when the people were rebuilding the temple, the, what we call the second temple, it's called the second temple period, they got tired, they got weary, and then you have Haggai coming up and say, you know, do not delay in rebuilding God's temple. And then now you have Malachi as well coming. You have Zechariah encouraging them. So these are the prophets we call the post exilic prophets, okay? Now what did Malachi say? Let's look at slide, the slide again. What did he say? He said, your Lord will suddenly come to His temple. In other words, if you remember the time when Solomon built his temple, the temple, the first temple, there was the Shekinah glory and presence of God that came. It was a cloud that came in. It was so thick that the people could not stand to worship God. But this time at the second temple, there was no Shekinah. There wasn't such an event so significant like a cloud coming in. So Malachi was trying to encourage the people and say, your Lord, the King, God, will suddenly come one day. So that is the context. So now when, they, now when you have Jesus coming in, He is also fulfilling this prophecy. He's coming right now into the temple. You understand what I'm saying? So Matthew 21 is significant in this sense. And I want to share all this with you because I, I would like, you know, sometimes in our sermon, right, to highlight a little bit of the Old Testament so that it is constantly in your thinking because otherwise you become very unfamiliar with, with the prophets in the Old Testament. So, now what we are seeing is this. From Jesus' perspective, again, see, because we are Gentiles. Remember why I share with you the Sherlock Holmes joke? Because from our perspective, we think, what's so important, all this? But from Jesus' perspective, it's very important. Because it's a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. It's a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. It's the fulfillment of all the hopes and the expectations of the Jewish people. They have been waiting and longing for God to come to their temple. The same way God came into the temple of Solomon in Solomon's days. They are waiting and waiting. So finally He's coming and now He's coming as a Davidic king the son of David, the son of God. But you know what? The people had no idea that Jesus was unlike any other king. He was unlike a Roman king or King Herod. He was a king who was going to die on the cross. This was something that in their wildest imagination, they never thought that that was going to happen. I'm talking about the multitudes, okay? They never thought that this was going to happen. So all the city was moved, verse 10. And they began to say, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. A prophet from Nazareth of Galilee, this phrase is not a phrase that is very, um, um, what do you call, exalting. It wasn't something to say, wow, he is a prophet from Galilee. It is a bit more demeaning because in those days, there was no prophet from Galilee or no, no important things come out from Galilee. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like Jerusalem is the city. If you want to have a king, a future king, he should be born and bred in Jerusalem. It shouldn't be in Galilee. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is uh, what we in Chinese we say, "niao pu sen tan de di fang," right? So that is the kind of concept they have. You say, "How do you know?" Because I want to show you two scriptures from the Gospel of John, and then you get an idea that that is the way they view this so-called prophet. In John chapter one verse forty-six, Nathanael said to him, "Can anything good come out of Nazareth?" Then Philip said to him, "Come and see." Nazareth is at Galilee, so. Who is this Jesus? He is called the Jesus of Nazareth. The Nathaniel said, Huh? Nazareth? What kind of place? It's a very small town. Anything good come out of it? No. Second verse, John 7 verse 52. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet 
has arisen out of Galilee. So you don't belong to any, what we call pure breed, pedigree. Who are you? You a prophet from Galilee? Who are you? Nothing. So that is the kind of attitude they, treat, they treated Jesus. So let's look at verse 12. Let's continue. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, you know when we see this act of Jesus, okay, overturning the tables, we will think that He's trying to purify the temple. You understand? From a chronological perspective, it looks like he was trying to clean the temple. But from a retrospective perspective from now, when we know that the temple, uh, later on in the scripture, you will see that the disciples say, Jesus, look at how beautiful the temple is. And he says, I tell you, not one stone will be on top of another. In other words, God is going to destroy this temple. You understand? So retrospectively, now we know in AD 70, when the Romans came and besieged Jerusalem, they, indeed, they destroyed the temple a second time. That is why today, you go to Jerusalem, you don't find that second temple anymore. You don't find Herod's temple anymore. Do you understand? So when you see him overturning the table, now when you read the scripture, you actually can deduce that he's not trying to purify the temple. He's actually trying to pronounce judgment on the temple. He's actually trying to say, God does not want this temple anymore. That is what he's trying to say. His act is an act of judgment and an act of removal. God is not wanting this temple. Why do, you, why do I say that? Don't forget, he, he, is, he is God in a physical human form. And the Lord will suddenly come to his temple, Malachi 3.1, right? And the people were, were waiting for the Shekinah glory. right? But look, when this king came, and this Lord comes to His temple, He finds that this temple was no longer... He cannot recognize temple You understand? He cannot recognize anymore that this temple is His own home. Then He makes a statement, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You know, um, we must be careful especially as we gather together as a, a church, that we don't end up focusing after a while on all the nitty-gritty things that ministry will, will demand of you. And then we start to squabble over small little things. It's just like at the temple today, they are not concerned about prayer, but what they're concerned about, hey, this dove, huh? how heavy is this dove? Hey, what is the exchange rate today? Do you understand? They are, they are concerned about all this buying and selling and all these nitty-gritty things, which is very often what eventually happens to a church. After a while, it's a lot of form, form and processes and policy, and we spend a lot of time doing all these things, but we spend very little time in prayer. My house is a house of prayer not a house for nitty-gritty things. Are you with me? Because if it becomes that, then God will remove it because that's not what He wants. He cannot recognize His house anymore. So today, I want to share with you in the remaining time that we have, the kind of house God wants. And it's not something new that you do not know, but I want to show you from a, a different perspective. And I believe today you will you will learn something and you'll be blessed. Verse 14, let's see. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now, what is the first thing that we must re recognize or must do in, in God's house? Number one, it must be a house for prayer for the sick. But, when I say prayer for the sick, immediately you're going to think, yes, Prayer for the sick, physical sickness, okay? But I want you to see also that the lame and the blind over here were also outcast in those days. In other words, the lame and the blind, 
you can imagine they are never going to come into the inner courts in the temple. Do you understand? Where will they be found? They are usually found by the gate. By the gate. By the gate side, begging. That's why you have a lame man in the gate, beautiful begging in the book of Acts. So when you see Jesus coming to the temple and you see the blind and the lame coming to Him, it tells you the heart of God. Imagine Jesus, right? He's God. and He is welcoming of the outcasts. He's welcoming of the weak. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that is the picture that I would really, really pray that our church can... It's the, it's the, it's a value okay, that we, our church holds. That we must exist not for ourselves. That the reason and purpose for our existence is for the weak, for the needy in society. So yes, we will pray, we will believe for physical healing, but we are also trying to love those who are despised by the world. That is why later on, we are coming, we're coming to it, but in Matthew chapter 25, you will find Jesus making statements like this, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. And then the people will say, but when did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you in prison and visit you? He said, in as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. So you see the spirit and the heart of God. Are you with me? You see, I, I want to share with you something else that, and this is, this is something uh, real and true in history, okay? In this book called The Rise of Christianity, okay, by a sociologist uh, called Rodney Stark, he examined the rise of Christianity from a small movement in Galilee and Judea at the time of Jesus to the majority religion of the Roman Empire a few centuries later, all right? And this is what Stark points out in his studies, that the, there are a number of advantages that Christianity had over paganism to explain its growth. And it's very long, but I want to take time to read to you, and I want you to see on the slide, okay? While others fled cities, Christians stayed in urban areas during plague, ministering and caring for the sick. Again, let me remind you, uh, what, are we, what are we looking at? This is sociology that studied the growth. Why is it that Christianity could grow so much? So these are the reasons he found in summary. He said Christian populations grew faster, faster because of the prohibition of birth control, abortion, and infanticide. Since infanticide tended to affect female newborns more frequently, in other words, people want male child rather than a female, Early Christians had a more even sex ratio and therefore a higher percentage of childbearing women than pagans. To the same effect, women were valued higher and allowed to participate in worship, leading to a high rate of female converts. Now, in a time of two epidemics in AD 165 and 251, which killed up to a third of the whole population of the Roman Empire each time, the Christian message of redemption through sacrifice offered a more satisfactory explanation of why bad things happen to innocent people. Because when you present the gospel message that Jesus was innocent and he died, and that this, was, is this message, this Christian message of redemption through sacrifice offered a more satisfactory explanation of why bad things happen to innocent people. Further, the tighter social cohesion and mutual help made them able to better cope with the disasters, leaving them with fewer casualties than the general population. So when we love and care for each other, we actually help one another and prevent and, and sort of bring forth fewer casualties. This would also be attractive to outsiders who would want to convert. Lastly, the epidemics left many non-Christians with a reduced number of interpersonal bonds, making the forming of new ones both necessary and easier. Last, uh, lastly, Christians did not fight against their persecutors by open violence or guerrilla warfare, but willingly went to their martyrdom while praying for their captors, which added credibility to their evangelism. So Stuck's basic thesis is this. Ultimately, Christianity triumphed over paganism because it improved the quality of life of its adherents at that time. 
You see, the first point that I wanted to show, let's put up the slide, the first point again, that when others fled the cities during plagues, Christians stayed in urban areas ministering and caring for the sick. You know how we should handle this crisis that we are in right now, the coronavirus? You know, Christians should be the first group, pe group of people that should not be xenophobic. Do you know that? Number two, Christians should be the first group of people that are not afraid to be at the front line to help. In other words, the Christian nurses and the Christian doctors should be the ones to rise up and really be there in the front, in the front line. This is our testimony. This is why we, and that's why I say, you must exist for a purpose. This is why you exist. I know we are all afraid, but what if I this? What if I get infected? What if my infection infects my family members and my house has children and elderly? I know. I know this is how we all think. But that is precisely why we believe in the gospel message that Jesus did not love his own life, you see. And he laid down his life for us. So that we, we should also likewise lay down our lives for one another. I want to tell you once again, I believe that we must be socially responsible. But we must not be afraid to shine in a time like this. Are you with me? <laughs> you know, I had a very interesting conversation with Jack, my wife. And I asked her this hypothetically. I said, Jack, if you are a uh, trained nurse, but now you are a retired nurse, and if you come to me and say, now there is a shortage of frontline healthcare workers and you would like to go back to the hospital to work. I say, what do you think will be my response to you? You know? Then I look at her and I say, I will encourage you to go back and work. Then she look at me like, if you are the retired nurse and you are the retired doctor, I may not be so quick to let you go back and work. Do you understand how real the struggle is? But I'm not a hero. I am sharing this only because of the thinking. That if we do something, we do it not because we are trying to be gung-ho. We do it because we are trying to fulfill Scripture. Do you understand why I say that now? Everything we do must be because this is what the Word of God encourages us to do. Then what does it mean to love your neighbour as yourself? So I was very encouraged in, in Singapore Bible College because I have a classmate and he's actually, uh, two of them, their husband and wife, they sign up to study for a master's uh, in intercultural studies. Okay? And last week, I, I re he actually announced to the whole school because he's a doctor. A, he's not a medical, like a doctor, GP kind of doctor, but he's a doctor that does research on this kind of contagious disease. So he decided, he and his wife, both of them, they are very young and they have a very young child, you know. Uh, the young child is only less than a year old. They decide, he decided that he will stop school and he will go back and be the healthcare worker to continue helping them with the research to try to contain this disease. I was very, very impacted, you know. He has a young child. And he's willing to sacrifice his school, even though he has already completed one semester. Now it's his second semester. He decided to take a break from school just to do this. You know that selflessness? And that's what I think Christians should be doing. And you know that um, uh, there are, there's now on, the, on WhatsApp going around saying that because of this virus, there's a, a shortage of blood. And so they are encouraging people to go up and donate blood. And then now I realize, I just heard a message again, that the queue is now two hours long. And many people are actually stepping forward to volunteer to donate blood. Things like this hearten my heart. You know. It makes me feel that this is what it is all about. That in a moment of crisis and need, that we do something, we rise up and we... We are, we are willing to lay down our lives for one another. So it's not about, it's not about the nitty-gritty things, how heavy is the duff, what is the exchange rate today, but it is about my house shall be a house of prayer 
a house where we pray for those who are in need. We reach out to the weak, the poor, the hungry. Amen? Okay, so that's the first thing. But I want you to see what is the response. Verse 14, Then the blind and the lame came to Jesus and He healed them. Verse 15, But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that He did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Now, let me just break up this verse a little bit. Everyone saw the healing. The, the scribes and the priests saw the healing. And why were the children shouting Hosanna? Because the children also saw the healing, you see. And when the children saw the healing, they were rejoicing, Hosanna! Wow! Hosanna to the Son of David. But when the priest saw the healing and saw the children praising this Jesus, they got upset. Do you, do you know it tells me one thing? Okay, This tells me uh, the contrast between the simplicity in the heart of the children versus the sophistication in the heart of the priest and the scribes. What? Later on, we're going to read. They're going to ask him this question. What gives you the authority? Who gives you the authority to do such things? Sophisticated. Tai Chong Ming, you understand? Sometimes in our ministry, okay, in our ministry, if you want to know whether we are doing it right, you observe the feedback from children. If the children are happy and they are learning and they are growing, then you, you know you're right. Do you understand? Because you look at the simplicity of their heart. We are too complicated. We are too complicated. So God's house, what, is, what does He want? Number two, it must be a house of praise and honour to God. That when we see something good, we see a good a, a person coming up to share a testimony of what God has done in his life, a small little blessing and we go, Hosanna to the Son of David, praise the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? And not be too sophisticated and complicated in the way we think. And I want to say this, one day we are going to have different ministries, okay? And... When God adds to our ministry, we praise God. But if God removes certain ministries, we should also praise God. Because then we know these are things He doesn't like. Because if there's something that He likes, He will add and He will bless. But if He doesn't like and He takes it away, we also say, thank God. Now we know this is something you do not want. Amen. So our hearts are pure and simple before Him all the time. It is not us building our kingdom. It is us building God's kingdom. We just want to serve and please Him. That must be our attitude. Now, so then we go on to verse 17. Verse, uh, so, then He left them and went out of the city to Bethany and He lodged there. So, Jesus left the city of Jerusalem and He went to Bethany I guess, okay, this is my guess, that he was not very welcome or received in Jerusalem. That's why he went to Bethany to lodge the night. Because, you see, the next verse says, verse 18, now in the morning, he returned to the city. So if he was going, his plan was to be in the city, why stay in Bethany? Of course, you can say, maybe too expensive. You know? All right, that could be a possibility because it's not clear. But I think he wasn't very well received. Now let's continue then. Verse 19. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Alright. 
Now, what is this, the significance of this fig tree with leaves but have no fruit? And why did Jesus have to judge this tree? Sometimes you think, oh, Jesus, you're so, you're so short fused. You go to this tree, you try to say, hey, no fruit. Ah, let, let, no, let no fruit ever grow from you again. You, know? you think he's, he's throwing a childish tantrum. No. Think of it metaphorically that this leaves, tree with leaves, is like the temple with many activities and movement, but have no fruit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So look at it as metaphorically, he's speaking. I mean, physically, yes, the tree got cursed, but it is, it is alluding to the future judgment on the temple, that the temple will be destroyed. A temple full of activities, but have no fruit. Now, the interesting thing now I want to bring to you is this last verse, verse 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Many times when we take this verse, we read this verse out of context. So we will claim it and then coupled with the earlier verse that we can say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done, right? So what we do is we then try to pray whatever we want, okay? Whether it's in our work or in our family or in our uh, material things that we need. So we say, every mountain that stands in the way of me getting what I want, be removed. That's the way we pray. And, and then we pray this, and we are believing, we ask in prayer, believing we will receive and we will receive it. That's the way we think. I want to tell you that if you look at the context, this context is not talking about getting things. You know. This context is talking about removing things. In other words, this verse is supposed to be applied to you and I that there are things in our life that is not pleasing to God, that is not bearing fruit, that we should ask Jesus to judge it, to curse it, to remove it from our lives and let it not grow fruit ever again. That should be the way we pray. It is about when he says, you can say to this mountain, be removed. What mountain is he talking about? Look at the direction he was. He was coming out of Bethany, now going back to the city. So the mountain is not mountains. It's not plural. It's singular. It's one mountain. It is, he's looking at the temple mount. He's looking at the mount where the temple is. He says, this temple will be removed because it's not bearing fruit. So whatever in your life and my life that is not pleasing to God, that is not bearing the right kind of fruit, should be removed. It's almost like you're saying, if there is an area of sin and bondage and bad habits, as if this area of my life is becoming like a den of thieves, it is full of activities, but it is not bearing the fruit that God wants, that may God judge it and let it wither away like the fig tree withered away. That is what God wants. A house of purity. Three things God wants. A house of prayer, a house of praise, and a house of purity. Amen? You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, it tells us that there is a time to plant and a time to pluck, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to gain, a time to lose. A time to keep, a time to throw away. You know, we, we, in our Christian life, we always have, we only think about getting, you know. We have never really thought about the removing, the getting rid of things that are cumbersome in our lives. Things that are the weight of sin that so easily ensnares us, that slows us down in our walk with God. 
that must be removed. When I was in prison, right, I lived such a simple life. I lived out of one box. Okay? And after, so we only had three t-shirts and three shorts. Everything must be within the box. After I came back home, I saw, I saw my house and I say, wow, it's too many things. I look at my cupboard and I say, it's too much, too much clothes. So I, me and my wife, I told her, I say, Jack, can we do something? From now onwards, every single day, we throw away something from our house. Throw away something that we don't use anymore. And let it be a habit that we will just remove stuff that's cluttering. Because I live such a simple life that I feel is such a precious, so precious and so beautiful to live a simple life. We... My, I don't have a watch when I was in prison. I don't have a phone. I don't have internet. But that two years, other than the fact that I was separated from my family, it was one of the most, you know, my mind was one of the clearest, worry-free, akuda matada, where you really live life like, you know, you have no worries. We, are too, we have too much things in our life that we really need to ask God to remove away. So this is my conclusion. This virus situation, a lot of people ask me, Pastor, you think this is a work of God? Or do you think this is a work of the devil? <laughs> is it a judgment of God? Or, and I tell them, I say, maybe we should look at it as a warning and a picture of what they meet in a market can do to us. In other words, I'm saying, you look at it and think what uncleanness can do to the whole world and what uncleanness in your life and my life can do to me. That little sin, that little compromise in the market, right? In China, they, they compromise. And what were they compromising they were compromising because they were trying to make money. They're trying to sell. They're trying to do business. It's Chinese New Year period. The little compromise and see what he has done to the rest of the world. We must look at it as a warning that we are just human beings and we are vulnerable. That we shouldn't be so proud or self-sufficient and think that we can make it on our own. Just one virus that we cannot see causes all of us to panic and to redraw in fear. One hachu, one water droplet can cause so much damage. I pray that we will be taught humility as we go through every single day. That when you take a hand sanitizer and you sanitize your hand, you must also remember to sanitize your spiritual life. Do you understand? That this is God trying to show us through these things that how important it is that we respond to Him in the right way. And lastly, I want to share with you a verse that is so significant but I never highlight. And that is verse... Nine, where the multitudes came out and they saw Jesus coming and they said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know this word Hosanna? What does it mean? I put it on the slide. It says, Hosanna is Hosanna in Hebrew, which means it's an exclamation of adoration and also a prayer. Lord, save us. When, we, when they were shouting, Lord save us, that means, especially the phrase, son of David, this phrase means the Davidic king, which means they are saying, you are the Messiah, you are the one that's going to come and save us. So, Hosanna, Hosanna. But in their mind, they're thinking, he's coming to save them from the Roman oppression. But they had no idea he was trying to save them from their sins by dying on the cross. What is more important? It's not the outward physical oppression. What is more important is to save you from your sin. 
Jesus says, it is not food that you eat that defiles you. It is what comes out of your heart that defiles you. The biggest rubbish dump is not out there. The biggest rubbish dump is you. It's you and I, me. You know, I pray, I say this, I say when I was, before we went to prison, we had this prayer. We always pray, Lord, the Lord's prayer. The, um, forgive us our sins, cleanse uh, as we forgive the sins of others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And, uh, and we pray and we claim that this evil is jail. Deliver us from jail. But after I've come out of jail, and I, come, I go around sharing with people, I say, I feel that this verse is fulfilled in my life, even though I went to jail. Because the evil is not the outward jail. The evil is me. The, the inward darkness and sin in my life. And I thank God that I went through this trial, I went through jail to deal with this. And today, I can share a message like this because I really believe that that is why Jesus came. He came to save us. Hosanna to the Son of David. And so it is the little things, okay? The little things that you do in, uh, you know, in, in, in your work, in the way you relate to people, the little, little things that you ask God, clean my heart spiritually, make it clean, save me. When we cry Hosanna, Lord save us, those things that are not pleasing to God, we are saying, God, judge it and remove it from our life. That is what I mean by save me. Judge it and remove it from my life. Save me from darkness. Save me from sin. Amen. So I want the musicians to come. This is why we, today we, sang, we, we choose to sing this song, Hosanna. And as we sing Hosanna, I want you to make it your personal prayer and ask God to heal our heart and make it clean. Pray Pray that God will, will once again do that saving work. If there's areas in our heart that we, we have been struggling with for so long and we feel like, then just like the fig tree, let's continue to pray and believe that in due time, it will wither away just like the fig tree withered away. Three kinds of, house, three kinds of things God wants in our house, His house, a house of prayer, a house of praise, in the house of purity. Let's just stand out on our feet right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for this reminder that we are just human beings, vulnerable before you. We are so vulnerable to a small disease and virus that we cannot see. But Lord, help us also to be reminded that we are vulnerable to a little sin in our life that we cannot see but it will affect us and it will defile us and defile the people that we love and so we pray to you that you will do as to the fig tree you do to this sin what you do to the fig tree and let it wither away today in your presence help us to truly be a temple of prayer a temple of praise and a temple of purity before you. Thank you, O oh God, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see the King of Glory. I see the King of Glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole of shame the whole of shame I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing The people sing Let's all sing Hosanna Hosanna Lord save us Lord save us Hosanna in the highest Hosanna 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 in the highest 
I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival. So today, why don't we come before the Lord and, and pray and ask Him to save us utterly, deeply, thoroughly in every area of our lives. And even if it takes time, if it takes a whole of our lifetime for God to do it, so be it that God, You will save us. Hosanna. Hosanna, my King. Save me from my sin. Save me from my pride. Save me from self-sufficiency. Save me when I, when times are good, I, I, I forsake the Lord and I walk away from Him. Save me for being so sophisticated. So that my heart is no longer simple before Him. So much for God to save. Save us from worry and anxiety and fear. But Lord, help us to have faith, to love and to trust You. That the birds, they neither sow nor reap, but not one will fall apart from the Father's will. The lilies in the field, all those things, Lord, the number of hairs on our head, Lord, you know. And so we entrust ourselves into your hands. Save us when we are so fearful, so worried, so afraid. Jesus, save us when we are selfish and we are not willing to lay down our life and to help when we know that we should and we can. Hosanna. Hosanna, my King. Help us to be like You. To love others the way You have loved us. Thank you.
you, God. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. One last time, heal my heart. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. So let me just pray for you. Father, I just pray that once again, save us and heal us, especially, Lord, even those who are watching online, if we are sick, as you heal the blind, you heal the lame, Jesus, we come before you to the temple and we say, Jesus, heal us from every sickness and every disease and protect us from every disease or virus. As we continue on our, our day, our, 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 as we continue on with our day, this coming week in our workplace Lord let us not be afraid help us not to be afraid rebuke every fear every unsoundness in our mind and rebuke it in Jesus name Father heal us we pray and we also pray that when there's opportunity for us this week to do good that we will be a, we'll be willing to do so and we ask that Lord but again, due to the fig tree and due to our life, those areas that are not fruitful anymore, that are not pleasing to you anymore, the same way you do it to the fig tree. Let it wither away, we pray. That maybe we be truly a temple of prayer, a temple of praise, and a temple of purity before you. Amen. So may the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the Lord bless you and keep you and the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. You know, in closing, as we say the Lord's Prayer, so now it makes even more meaning because where the name of God the Father is hallowed, that means when we, when we know that God's name is holy, that is where His kingdom is. Every time we hallow His name, we walk in purity and holiness. That's where the kingdom of God is within us. So let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. So thank you, Lord, for this time that we have. We continue to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand right now. Thank you, Jesus. All right, service is over. Thank you for watching with us online and... Uh, we pray that God's peace will be with you as He is with us. Amen. God bless you. See you next week online.